of springtime rain To have a friend right in your corner Your heart will feel a little warmer Tender, loving Good evening. Welcome to Tender Loving Care. I'm Leslie Kennedy and this is my son Paul Kennedy and we're substituting for Greenbrier Almond who is away. Today we'll bring you more readings and understanding and poetry from the Bible. You know that Greenbrier talks about Christianity and faith and how they work together in healing and I talk about how the Word of God and the things I study and how they inspire me in creative writing. And so that's what we are going to discuss today or illustrate to you in our readings and the poetry. The first, there's actually two readings in this, uh, but the first of the readings comes from John Chapter 14, verses 8 through 14. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not recognize me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, be but if you do not then believe me because of the works themselves, very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This reading comes from Acts, chapter 2, verses 17 through 21. In the last days it will be God. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You shall renew the face of the earth, O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful. According to today's reading, the Spirit of God works in all believers and will work through all kinds of believers. Peter does not describe an, ex an exclusive club where an elite few know the inside truth and others are shut out. He describes a fellowship where God speaks and acts through the weak, the old, the young, even women. The church that is, the church that this spirit inhabits, is open to all kinds of people. Cornelius, who has been seeking God in his own way, 
the Ethiopian eunuch who would not have been allowed into the synagogue because he was incomplete, damaged, unworthy to draw close to God, slaves and slaveholders together. This church is open to all who call on the name of the Lord, and whoever believes in Jesus Christ will do the kinds of works that Jesus does. The church, empowered by the Spirit, is utterly democratic. The theory makes a fine speech, but the reality is not as pleasant, of course. We know that in spite of Peter's words on Pentecost, Acts later tells us of the church arguing over who should be over over who could be admitted and what rules of Jewish laws Gentile converts would have to keep. After all, we cannot allow too much of that sort of thing, welcoming everyone and talking about God working through anyone. If we want to be the church that Peter envisioned and on which Jesus poured out power, we might have to make some changes. Who absent, who's absent from your fellowship? What is Christ saying about, your, about what your fellowship could be, and what is your part in it? Called, this poem is called, A Crying Need of the Soul. We have a crying addiction in our soul, a place no drug can fill, over which we have no control. It was there the day we were born, for there is a place where for God we yearn. Lord, like nectar in a flower, this yearning seems to me. Nothing can fill this place, no riches, fame, or idols. Nothing can resemble thee. The original, the great I am, you are the original that nothing rivals, nothing made of man. It is said that today many die, not knowing thee, for they have never encountered thy grace and love with what you have blessed me. Steadfast lover, my king of kings, Oh, how my heart delights in the wonder of your love brings. Your Holy Spirit you have sent to me. Now I fill you with me always, and I need not pine for thee. In my soul, my spirit rests with ease. There is no crowding. You are in the place where you were meant to be. Now my cravings for you are filled every day, as your spirit teaches and leads me in your way. This next reading comes from Romans chapter 10, the second half of verse 8 through verse 13. The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, No one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word is near you, on your lips, and in your heart. So Paul assures the young community at Rome. Rome, a crossroads for the world, and fertile ground for planting the gospel of Jesus. Gospel cultures come together here in unexpected ways. Everything old becomes new again. The new insight into ancient truth, which Paul bears witness, that the holy may be encountered and known in Christ Jesus is available to all, not only the Jews, followers of the law, but also to Gentiles, strangers, aliens, newcomers to the faith. One may come to know Jesus in all sorts of ways, through the law, through the stories, through community, through heartfelt experience, like Paul's own. Faith in Christ is possible for all. But it is not simply for us to know by heart. We need to speak what we know. 
Paul bids us believe in our hearts and confess with our lips the truth about God and Jesus. He insists on that powerful pairing of heart and voice, of hidden and public, of knowledge received and knowledge proclaimed, so that knowledge may shape our lives and our world. The word is very near us, in our hearts and on our lips. Paul's Rome and our world have much in common, a global crossroads experienced in ways unimaginable, unimagined by Paul. Strangers and friends sharing a fragile, complex environment, today in cyberspace as well as face-to-face -face reality. So many ways to open our hearts to Jesus, so many ways to proclaim what we come to know about Christ, so many ways to shape our world out of that knowledge, welcomed in our hearts and proclaimed by our voice. The word Christ is very near you. The word Christ is very near you. Just a plea away. When life hits the rocky roads, all must, one must do is pray. The word is very near us, connecting us to the Heavenly Father, whom we can trust. The word is in our hearts, our minds, everywhere. The word is as near as the very air we breathe. Just look at certain at creation and see God's glory. If life seems dark and helpless, know God by studying God's word, God's history, by praying and listening so God's voice can be heard. This will give you wisdom, knowledge too, and confidence that the word is always there to guide you. This reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4 and 13. I do, not, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized in, into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But he, with the testing, he will also provide the way out, so that you may be able to endure it. Anguish had a face this day. I knew the word, but had not been in its presence until the morning of the accident. As I held my friend in my arms, both of us still stunned by her husband's sudden death. All we could do was cling to each other. No words of comfort would come, only unfettered, embodied anguish. After what seemed like an unreal forever, my friend whispered words that I could not hear. I pulled away so that we could look at each other and asked what she had said. I want to scream at God, she told me. I want to scream at God. How can God let this happen? Quietly grieving in deep sobs, she dropped her face back onto my sh sh shoulders. Then scream at, then scream. Tell God. Scream at God what you felt. You can do that, I said to my friend. There is nothing you want to say that God does not want to hear. Weeks later, after beginning to put her family's life back together, we sat in her kitchen. She told me that until that day, she never knew it was acceptable to be openly angry with God. She was taught that a faithful person can handle anything without being tempted to, call, to question or rail against God. Yet in that morning of inexpressible pain, the temptation to throw the anger and despair exploding in her soul toward God had been real. She had not known that other faithful people felt the same. Yet encouraged to trust God with her deepest self, she began to pray her anger and despair. What she discovered was not distance from God, but closeness that will not let her go. 
our reading reminds us that God has been, is, and will be faithful through every situation and temptation we experience. God is with us, whatever we face or endure. God will supply a way out. Uh, a little something I'd like to add to that is that there are, are numerous examples throughout the God where prophets, wise men, people who are thought to be uh, with God have railed against God, have been angry at God, and very outspoken about it. They've written it down. Uh, the Psalms are filled with numerous ones where the writer is angry at God. And the Psalms are filled with uh, numerous ones that are uh, filled with anger, despair, depression, sadness, uh, all sorts of negative emotions. The Psalms aren't just filled with the positive emotions, but God can take it all, and God can forgive us for all of it, and He still loves us. God's sustaining mercy. God's sustaining mercy, it is what life is all about. God's sustaining mercy is something we can do, so is not something we can do without. God's sustaining mercy is why I am alive today. God's sustaining mercy has guided me on my way. God's sustaining mercy I count on every day. God's sustaining mercy hears my heart when I pray. God's sustaining mercy, I see it driving down the road. God's sustaining mercy, an accident missed or I get towed. God's sustaining mercy is that unexpected call. God's sustaining mercy is someone to catch you if you fall. God's sustaining mercy is here for big things and small. God's sustaining mercy is always so we know who to call. This reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 7 through 11. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be, and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places, famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from the heaven. This is called Dread and Dreams. Oh, you haven't finished. <laughs> Sorry. Part of the Gospel of Luke presents an, op an apocalyptic vision of what will follow the period of personal suffering that Jesus' followers will endure. This prophecy seems to involve all humankind in catastrophe, signifying the end of the world. For followers of Jesus, the Jesus who speaks of Apocalypse seems remote, the message unbelievable and frightening. He speaks out of a long tradition of doomsday prophets. However, we do not read this passage out of context. The verses that follow this passage make clear that Jesus' predictions pertain to Jerusalem and the Jewish people, and the light of the suffering endured during the during and after the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD, Luke's audience would well understand and the vision's horror. The world as they knew it had shattered, and they must have viewed the events as signifying the end times. Metaphorically speaking, the world, the world is always ending for someone. Just ask the inmate on death row in the hours before execution are the survivors in a Middle Eastern village just after a drone has dropped its cargo. Ask the tornado victims in Joplin, the hurricane victims in New Orleans, the flood victims in Waterbury, Vermont. 
Even those of us not immediately affected by wars and natural disasters confront the end in various ways. The end of fresh water, of rain in the desert, of air safe to breathe and food safe to drink, eat. The end of creatures great and small, from aphid to polar bear to us. However, we are co-creators with God of a livable space. If we want to prevent or at least postpone the end of the world as we know it, we must alter our way of being in it altogether. We must convince our life we must conceive our lives in terms of deed and not doom. Dread and Dreams Dreams and dreads. We have them both, and often the dread sabotages the dreams we host. But what if we, instead of dread, thanked our Lord God for the dreams instead? What if we praise God every day and work towards the dreams that come our way? The dreams of the church that Christ has given, me and you, pass through the saints each generation to renew the dreams and our faith and the next generations too. The dreams of our lives also gifts from God, waiting to be fulfilled with our skills, our God, given talents, but always led by God's Spirit, so we stay in balance. So let us not dread such dreams, for fear is debilitating. Let us hope and pray and believe our God's help is waiting just for the asking. Amen. Amen. This is something I was pondering from all the different snips and bits I remember from verses and, and things. I never seem to be able to remember whole passages at a time. It's called Heaven's Citizenship. I took Christ as my Savior and started a new life. While Jesus lives in heaven, oh, excuse me, I have to start over. I took Christ as my Savior and started a new life. What a surprise to learn, Christ took me as his wife. Well, Jesus lives in heaven, long distance marriages don't do well. But I found I need not worry, for in me, like Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells. Another thing quite shocking, a citizen of heaven I now am, I wondered as a mortal, could I possibly enter in? But heaven reaches down to earth, where God's children are, and Christ's ambassadors are we, and we travel near and far. This ambassador thing is an uncomfortable thought to me, but the Holy Spirit is coaching me and says, Love kindness, show mercy. Love kindness, show mercy. Well, that doesn't sound too hard, but that do not judge people is tricky but I don't want from heaven to be barred. There's more to being a citizen of heaven than at first meets the eye. Sometimes it's so frustrating, I could just lay down and cry. Then I read the Psalms, and David had these troubles too. He did lay down and cry to God, so I believe I'll do that too. Other times, though, being a child of God is to happiness that is warmly sweet, and there is no way to express its glorious joy so complete. This reading is from Luke, chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Elsewhere in the Bible, Writers compare God's voice to a peal of thunder, 
For many, thunder causes unease. And when we are confronted by the living God in confession or calling, that unease seems appropriate. But God's presence manifests in ways other than thunder. In Luke's Gospel, a voice that speaks of love accompanies Jesus' baptism. No loud boom here, only the tickle of dove's wings. I was baptized in my mid-twenties in a church more familiar with infant baptisms. Though of average height, I felt the need to bend low at the waist to keep my head over the font. I didn't want to make a mess. I didn't consider how I looked until I heard the peals of laughter, not thunder. Somehow I sensed that the members were laughing with me, not at me. Laughing in joy with an adult who is now going where too often only infants dare to tread. Laughing in joy with a stranger who had found a home. At the Jordan River with so many baptized, among waves of confession and forgiveness, it was new life like a cup running over. And then, to top it off, God's Son joins this new family, wading into the swirling waters of dying and rising, peril and promise. In our holy washing, is it laughter that we hear? Laughter not from having been caught in sin, but rather from having been freed from it. I frequently look back on that day remembering how I could have been laughed at, judged, or considered a stranger. Instead, I experienced a love that carried me through those infant steps of faith and allowed me to hear God's call in my life. And with ears of the heart to hear it, I suspect I might have heard God laughing all along. We don't really have time for another poem. We're running out of time. But I think that particular reading was the best. So, is there anything about any of the stuff that we've read that you'd ha like to mention? Well, I've already mentioned it during uh, the, about the trials and that God doesn't put you through anything or make you suffer through anything that he does not believe you can handle and he won't put you through anything without first getting making sure that there is a way for you to get out of that situation or to get through it. And the Holy Spirit and Christ, they're always with you as you go through things. May God bless you for this week and be with you always. Amen. Amen. Stories of a West Virginia Doctor, written by Dr. Harold D. Allman. A collection of 55 short stories about his experience as a small town doctor in central West Virginia. And tender loving care. Stories from a West Virginia Doctor, Volume 2, written by Dr. Greenbrier Allman. Using videotapes to write 70 additional stories of his father's very colorful life as a small town doctor. They can be found for purchase at Amazon.com and most local bookstores. Tune into Channel 3 Buckhannon for Tender Loving Care with Dr. Greenbrier Allman, where he talks about the connection between Christianity and medicine.